So my question is, are you going to be that person who makes that decision and says, you know what, I've lingered here long enough. Or are you going to stay there long enough trying to test the extent of the grace that is being made available to you? I tell you that we're all surviving on grace truth. But my thing is that I don't want to test the limits to see, okay, how, how long can I go? How far can I push it before it is clear that I have come to the end of this rope? I thank you for today. I thank you for your word that you have put in the mouth, in my mouth this morning. I thank you, Lord, because even as I deliver that word today, I will speak not of myself, but of you. I will speak your heart. I will speak your counsel. I will speak even as you give me grace in the name of Jesus. I ask that my vessel be yielded completely, even right now, to the spirit of the living God, and that the words that I speak to the people are in the spirit and life transforming them from the inside out and bringing them into the fullness of that which you have for them in the name of Jesus. Lord, if there be any distractions here today, I take hold of it. I, you know, cancel that distraction even right now in the name of Jesus. I ask that the hearts of the people be tuned into you, that they hear you, not me, but you. Let everything it is that I speak today come straight from you. Let it reach everyone at the point where they need to hear a word from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so if you're on YouTube, um, and that's, that's why we're encouraging you guys to uh, log in on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, you've already seen the title of the uh, teaching today, and I'm going to just be doing a short teaching. I think it's going to take more of a Bible study style. So just looking at certain portions of the Bible and going into what it represents for us, going into what it really means, you know, and one of the reasons that I love spending time with the Bible is, is that it's ever fresh. So there are things that you will read, there are places that you will read, and you might read it 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, and each time there will always be something new that comes out of it for you. So today I'm going to be taking a close look at the story of Lot. If you're on YouTube and everything is fine, please indicate in the comment section. And even if not just to confirm that everything is fine, it's good to know you're there. Okay. So if you log on to YouTube, don't be quiet. You know, it's easier to see you all on Teams because I can see all your names and all of that. I know you're there. But if you're on YouTube, just say something. Whenever you log on, just say a quick hello. Just, you know, something, put something in there just so I can feel your presence as well, right? So thank you so much, Suzanne. Suzanne is, is, is a constant, you know, when it comes to consistency, Suzanne is always there. So God bless you, Suzanne. Um, but so um, I'm going to be reading today. It's going to be a bit of scripture reading, but I think it's important for us to do it. Um, I have two key portions of the scripture that we'll read. And once we're done with that, um, or at least I think I would, might just pause and go in between and all of that, and then just, you know, go into what the Lord would have us look at today. So Genesis chapter 13 from uh, verse 8. Yeah, I think verse 8 is fine. Now, this is a portion of scripture that we're all familiar with. At least I think that most of us are familiar with, okay? So it's the portion of scripture. Thank you very much, Shadi. Thank you so much, um, uh, Catherine. So, okay. Um, it's a portion of scripture I think we're all familiar with. You know, we've read it a number of times. Um, we pretty much know what the whole thing is about. And I think I've taught around this portion of scripture uh, a couple of different times, maybe more, um, in different ways. But today I want us to examine something here that, um, like I said, when you read the Bible and the more you go into it, the same portion keeps saying different things every time because it is fresh. It is a fresh word from the Lord. Um, so it says here from verse eight, it said, and Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So we all are familiar with this, but for the sake of those who are not, um, I'm not going to assume everybody knows this stuff. So this is the portion of scripture, um, for when around the time when Lot and Abram were going to separate, right? So we all know the story. Um, Abraham's called out of his land, out of his family, all of that. And he lives there with Lot, who's his nephew. And um, they're living together. And with time, as time progressed, you know, Lot's, um, oh, <laughs> Madame B, I see you. Uh, Lot had, you know, gathered also, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, cattle and all kinds of things um, along with uh with Abram. So, it, you know, it was said that the place was too big to contain the both of them. And so they had to separate, they had to split up and it was causing issues actually. So it wasn't even that they just decided to say, you know what, this makes sense. No, they had enough struggle, enough strife that they decided, you know what, this is not even okay. 
Uh, so Abraham says, you know what, let this thing end, let this strife end. You take what you have and go where you want to go and I'll do the same and I will give you, you know, uh, the right of, of choice, you know, to choose first. So you look around, whatever you like, take it just as long as you go. <laughs> and sometimes this may be what we need to do with some of the kind of relationships that we have around our lives is we may need to get to that point where we're like, you know what, whatever you need to have, like, just take it as long as you go right now that's not really my message today but i felt the need to mention that right like this is abraham like really really wanting peace and it's like you know what if this peace is going to come by him taking the best things or the best items the best land whatever just take it as long as you go because that relationship with god is more important than these things or this you know whatever it is that might seem like i need to hold on to it right so that's what happens and so now to verse 8 it says and abram said unto lot let there be no strife i pray thee between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen for we be brethren is not the whole land before thee separate thyself i pray thee from me if thou will take the left hand then i will go to the right or if thou depart to the right hand then i will go to the left and verse 10 says it says and lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So this was before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It said, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. And then Lot chose him all of the plain and Lot of Jordan, Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So, quick recap. They've made the decision to split up, to part ways. And so Lot has chosen because Abraham did give him that right. Like, you know what, you go out first, choose what you want and I'll take the rest. And he did. And this verses in verse 10 to 13 give us a very detailed description of Lot's choice. You know, I love it. It says it was well watered everywhere. It said, um, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, you know, and these were the things he was looking at. And he decided, you know what, this is what I need in my life right now. And he chose it. He didn't even think about Abraham, who like literally was the one who brought him into where he was at this point in life. And may God help us, because the truth is many times as humans, you know, that selfish nature it just seems to come out even when we don't expect it so abraham is the reason why this man even you know is making certain kind of advancements in his life and then when it comes time to choose it's like i'm gonna take what i want you know abraham you figure yourself out <laughs> and he took everything that looked good and all of that you know so but that's that and many of us are very familiar with this story and i think one of the first thing i want to point out here is what it you know is said about like where he was located it said and abram dwelled in the land of canaan and lot dwelt dwelled in the cities of the plain and he pitched his tent toward sodom now it's very interesting and like i said a few things you need to capture in like the description of what's going on here with Lot is they said he pitched his tent near sodom okay so he wasn't exactly living in sodom he wasn't necessarily in there it said his tent was just towards sodom okay i don't know exactly what that means i don't know if it was like one footstep away from sodom right but when you say um oh going toward a particular place it's clear that like you're not there it's just like you're on that way you know what I mean? Like you're right there, maybe close, maybe, you know, a little way away, but you're literally on the path headed to that place. So that's what we have here as the description of where um, Lot uh, lived. Now, we're familiar with a, a few things that happened after that time. You know, then there was the captivity and then Abraham coming to fight for him, all of that and capture or, you know, capture him back and all of that and his stuff. But again, that's not the focus of our teaching today. And in order to get us close to the focus of our teaching, I want to start to move towards Genesis 19, okay? So some time passes while Lot is living in this place because as we know, okay, if you look at a couple of uh, chapters later, the Bible says, and now so <laughs> Lot was living in Sodom, which is interesting because at the point in time where he moved and he chose, he was towards Sodom. But at the point in time where Abraham, actually, I think it was from where Abraham needed to come fight for him and rescue him and all of that. At this point in time, Lot was now also there. Lot was part of the people. And so when they came and packed everyone, that's what it says in um, 
uh, Genesis chapter 14. It says, when they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and all of that, they also took Lot, who dwelled in Sodom and his goods and departed. So in chapter 13, Lot lives near Sodom. Lot is headed towards Sodom. By 14, he's in Sodom. And so by the time they are coming to pack everybody in Sodom into captivity, by the time they are coming to take everyone, kidnap everybody, Lot is in that mix as well. The Bible makes it clear. So that we don't think it's because they were on the way. <laughs> Maybe it was as they were on the way. They were packing everyone on the way. No, they said Lot dwelled in Sodom, verse, verse 12. It said, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. So they took him from Sodom which is not where we left him in chapter 13, okay? So please just keep that and just hold that. And so Abraham has to go in there, um, you know, go fight for him, retrieve him, all of that, and, you know, wish him well, release him back into his life. Now, chapter 13, sorry, chapter 19, I think, is where we'll begin to kind of, you know, get the, uh, the entire picture together. Now, this is right after Abraham had uh, hosted the... Um, you know, the celestial visitors, as the Bible puts it. It's where he had hosted these angels who visited his house, right? And as they're leaving, you know, they're having that conversation and um, they decide to bring Abram into the council of God. So Abram is informed that they're actually going to destroy, you know, Sodom, right? And so Abram, obviously, we know the story. He's interceding for, um, he's interceding for Lot and trying to make sure that Lot is not, you know, part of it. So instead of just saying, oh, wonderful, he's actually praying for the man. Like, okay, I get it that this place has to go down, but can you spare it if you find this number of people? If you find this number of people, the whole thing was he was just trying to help Lot. And I'm going to pause here and begin to get into the message. Because like I've titled this thing, I'm talking about the deception of sin. This story between Abraham and Lot, Sodom, the angels, it's very descriptive of the kind of life that many of us live. It's very descriptive of the kind of path many of us choose. Whether because that's the only one we've seen, that's the only one we've known. Maybe it's based on the family we come from. Or it just seems like this looks good. And so I'm going to go there. And it somehow has to happen that this man continues to get himself in a situation where someone constantly has to come to bail him. So it wasn't enough that they came and captured him from Sodom when those four kings, I think there were four kings, came and packed everyone. It took Abraham, who was minding his business, to stand up and go fight for him. I don't think there's too many uh, uh, other instances that the Bible refers to of when Abraham had to go fight. This was the one time that Abraham had to get up and go fight a battle and it was because he needed to go help Lot. So this thing keeps happening where in the first place, uh, Abraham goes and, you know, gets a uh, lot out of there. Second time, Sodom is going down. Abraham yet again is interceding for, 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 for Lot because he's in there. So the question is this. At what point does a person look at their location, look at their life? And when I mean location, I don't mean physical location. I'm talking about your spiritual location. That is whether I'm living, you know, uh, as the Bible says, it's sin unto death, Right? But at what point does a person look at their lives, the location, and decide, you know what? Where I am is the problem that I have. It's not so much that these people are doing this or doing that. It is the fact that I'm in the wrong place. And again, like I said, I'm not necessarily talking about a wrong physical location. I'm talking about a wrong life, literally. So if they have to come pull you out of there the first time and then they still have to intercede for you the second time, at what point do you begin to tell yourself, it might be that where I am, the life that I'm living is a problem unto me. And if there will be some sort of stability in my life, if there will be some sort of, uh, would I say, peace in my life, if things will actually begin to follow the path that they're supposed to, maybe I'm going to need to take myself out of this way of life. This was the question that Lot needed to ask himself. And this, like I said, is the path that many of us are on. So we are living a certain kind of way, fully aware of where we are, because uh, Lot was not ignorant about the way of life of the people of Sodom. But somehow it was okay for him to be in there. 
Now, some of us may say that, oh, you know, he was still a righteous man and he was in there. But the question is, why did he need to be in there up until when that place needed to be taken down? The issue with many of us wanting to still fraternize and just kind of just, you know, stay there, even though we're telling ourselves that, oh, you know, I've, you know, given my life or I'm different or whatnot, is that at some point in time, you might find yourself placed in a situation, in a location where judgment is coming for that place. And because you have not known to move yourself out of that way of life, because you have not known to move yourself out of that path, that judgment hits that place and it hits you too. So now let me just read uh, the portion in uh, Genesis 19 that I wanted us to take a look at, okay? Because the Bible is talking about the angels, you know, then coming to Sodom. It said, and Lot sat in the gate of, of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, many of us can, I know I've heard people say that, oh, that's descriptive of, you know, pray, you know, intercession, you know, being at the gates, right? Um, that's not my message. I'm going to leave that. The day, you know, we need to look at that, or the day someone needs to look at that, that'll be fine. And if that's the case, that's all well and good, right? That's not really a problem. But the problem begins to show up from verse 12. So this is after, you know, the angels have, you know, pulled lots back into the house because the people of Sodom came with their mess, right? Saying that they have to know the angels and all of that. And Lot, and lot is begging them and saying no. And then he pulls the angels, you know, pull him into the house and shut the door. Now, verse 12, it says, and the men said unto Lot, has there, has thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Bring them out of this place. I don't know why he needed to have angels come and tell him. I don't know why he needed to have this divine visitation. Because at the point in time where Abraham had to come fight for him and retrieve him and all of that. He, at, at, at that point, maybe he should have begun to ask himself, is it possible that this place that I'm in is a problematic place? But they tell him, they said, and the men said unto Lot, Has thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons um, and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, it says, And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And I want to pause here before I move forward. Because for many of us who have identified, it has now become clear to us that the life that we're living is far from pleasing to God. And as a matter of fact, not only is it not pleasing to God, it is marked for judgment. It is marked for destruction. There seems to be that inability to make a decision to get up and walk out of that life. Why? Because we're surrounded with people who are like his sons-in-law. It says, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. We are surrounded by people who trivialize the things of God. We are surrounded by people who mock the things of God. We are surrounded by people who downplay the requirements of God of the life of a believer. We are surrounded by people who think that pursuing a life of holiness is overdoing it when it's not you who killed Jesus. We are surrounded by people who have to find something, you know, uh, sarcastic to say about our desire to pursue God. This is the reason why many of us hesitate because you will find that in verse 15 and verse 16, the Bible says, when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lord saying, arise, take your wife, take your two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of, of the city. So somehow they're like, if the sons-in-law, you know, are not interested in going, you take yourself and leave. And this is the message for someone. Like I said, I don't think today's message is going to be that long. It's just a very pointed message for someone. Because part of the deception of sin is that you will not realize how much of an impact it is having on your life or how much of an impact it's about to have on your life until it actually comes down on you. So the angels, even by morning said, take your wife, take your, uh, yeah, take your sons, you know, take everybody, go out. Take your wife, your two daughters, and all of that. Leave this place, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of, of the city. And the Bible says, and while he lingered, the men, had, the men had to lay hands upon him and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hands of, of his two daughters. Um, the Lord be merciful unto him, it says, I say, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. I want to read that again. It says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And it says, And while he lingered, 
the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord be merciful unto him. This is the Lord's mercy literally going into effect on his behalf. Not that he was that good or wise. Why? Because you've been told what you need to do and you're still there. It said, and they brought him forth out of the city. I want to say something that many of us are living on the intercession of other people. This is exactly what was, what was going on with Lot. It wasn't so much that Lot knew what to do. It's that we're living on the intercession of other people. And you, the, 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 listen, I don't know how I'm going to say this in a way that's not harsh. The truth is, you don't have all the time. You think you have all the time to make up your mind, to break away from that life of sin. You really think you have a couple more months, a couple more years, a couple more passes at this thing before you make up your mind, before you make that decision to actually truly follow God. And this is where Lot was. He was lingering. Imagine that these people have told him, our assignment, we didn't come to have social, you know, uh, times with it. We came to destroy it. So it's not like you are confused, but it said while he lingered. My question is, what is he lingering for? This man who came here, came here on serious business. And the sons-in-law who were not going to take the uh, instructions serious, they had really just removed them from this equation. And at this point in time, the focus was on Lot. Lot, take your things, leave this place. And the Bible said he still lingered. The Bible said he was still, you know, that's just dancing around it. And I don't know, you know, how many of us this describes. Where we have decided that we must still linger around it. I don't know what we think is in there for us. And we're still dancing around it. We're still lingering around it. This man was running on time that was bought by Abraham's intercession. And he couldn't understand it. So many of us do not really realize that where we are, the time we think we have to still enjoy, I'll put that in air quotes, right? Enjoy this life of sin. We don't know when that clock will stop. We don't know it. So this message today is more so a call to assess your life and get yourself back under alignment. If for whatever reason you have decided to get comfortable in this life of sin, this life that doesn't please God, Today, Shade was talking about what we needed to do as far as praying to God and giving thanks to God with today being, you know, um, the day before the last day of the month of June, the first half of the year. And many of us do not understand that the biggest thanks we can give to God is the life that we live that is free of sin, that is bringing up a sweet smelling savour unto him because we have indeed decided to embrace the life of righteousness that he handed to us. That is the biggest thanks we can give to God. That is us letting him know that the sacrifice of Jesus was not in vain over us. That is the biggest thanks we can give. So we can give thanks with our mouth, but the thanks that God is looking to receive from us more so, is not the one that's coming from our mouth. It's the one that comes from our life because our life is indeed a sweet smell that's coming up to him. So my call and my cry constantly is that we're not people who are acting in a way that makes it clear that we're not paying attention to the things that matter to God. Many of us think that the way that we'll place God is, be, is if we, you know, do these wild dances and all of that praise dance and all of that. And listen, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it because you absolutely should. You absolutely should give thanks to God. But my thing is this, is that what is the purpose of vocalizing thanks when your heart is in a different posture? What is the purpose of giving thanks from your mouth when your life is anything but a thanksgiving to God? When your actions are anything but showing gratitude for the sacrifice? So we, we give thanks because we receive things. We give thanks because we get a breakthrough here. We get a promotion there. We get one or two things. That is the basis upon which we are giving thanks to God. But the real thanks, I'm saying it again, that God seeks to have from our lives is a life that is well-pleasing unto him. That's what the Bible tells us. That reasonable sacrifice of our life, where we're able to look at sin for what it is, and make a conscious decision by the help of the Spirit of God within us to walk away from it. So grace is available because that's really what this thing is right now that I'm trying to explain to you going on with Lot. That he sat down there, 
letting the grace that was extended toward him almost be in vain. Because a way had been made for grace to be made available for him. And many times, instead of us to embrace that grace and let it propel us into the life that God is calling us into, we almost use it as an excuse to linger in the life that God is trying to draw us and drag us out of. But the question is, how long will you do it? How long will you do it? And so the angel, this man had to lay hand um, upon Lot and pull him out of the city. Why? Because grace was speaking for him. Because do you realize that they didn't even ask many questions about his sons, you know. When those ones decided that their job, their job description was to be a mocker, they didn't even waste time there. But God, made, uh, these men made a, made a decision to insist on getting Lot out of there. The, what this thing is telling us is what grace looks like. It's not because Lot was the wisest person to know that he shouldn't have been there in the first place. It's not because Lot was the most responsive believer to know that, okay, um, let me leave this place right away. The Bible said he lingered. And that is how many of us linger. Grace is available, but we choose to linger in the life that we have. Somehow we have this idea that we have a meter. So we will know when we reach the end of the line so that we can adjust. But the truth is, Lot did not know how much time he had left before that place was going to go down. So my question today is this, where are you still lingering? Where are you still lingering? Knowing that this thing brings up a foul, you know, smell as far as the, 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 the odor that's coming up to him. Because that's exactly the reason why he was coming to this place. He said, the cry of that place has come up to me. That place I'm hearing that it's a mess. So my question is, are you going to be that person who makes that decision and says, you know what, I've lingered here long enough. Or are you going to stay there long enough trying to test the extent of the grace that is being made available to you? I tell you that we're all surviving on grace, truth. But my thing is that I don't want to know, I don't want to test the limits to say, okay, how, how long can I go? How far can I push it before it is clear that I have come to the end of this rope? This man had a line of grace that was open unto him, a line of grace that was extended unto him, but he chose to linger there. But the mercy of God was still speaking. And he said, and the Bible says that they, uh, they took his hands, took the hands of his daughters and everybody and brought them out of the city. Now, verse 17, I'll move on here. It says, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight. This is the same you know, thing I've been I'm talking about. That willingness to take advantage, not in a good way, of grace. It said, Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. It says, and I cannot escape to the mountain. What is his reason? Say, let some evil take me and I die. So God is asking you to go to the mountain, but you are, you are convinced in your heart that there's an evil waiting for you there that will take you and that's where you are going to die. And I want to spend a bit of time here because I love the words that were used by Lot when he was asking for this uh, allowance. It says, oh, not so, my Lord. They are telling him, leave this place. We're going to destroy it. This place is coming down in smoke in a few minutes. Get out of here. And he said, look at his plea. And do not even look at Lot and think that what a, you know, a, a person he is, because that is how many of us are. He said, oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace, right? There's enough grace now. Why should I stress? I can just do a little thing here and there and then come back and say, God, forgive me. Oh God, I'm sorry. It says, behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight and thou had magnified thy mercy. This is where many of us stay. This is where we like to camp as believers. Is your mercy not endless? Is it not new every morning? Is your grace not infinite? Is it not your grace that covers everything? It says, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain lest some evil um, take me and I die. 20, it says, behold now this city. It's near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. They are destroying this place called Sodom. 
and you are given an instruction that says flee to the mountains that is move far away from here don't be found close to this place and someone is saying yes i'm going to pursue god but not to that extent do you understand what what i'm saying here i'm going to serve god but not to that extent i'm going to live a life that is free of sin but you know the lord i'm a work in progress Listen, we're all a work in progress, but when that statement that says that you are a work in progress becomes the excuse that Lot gave here, you are only deceiving your own self. Because what happens in this story is quite scary. Because if you continue down from that verse 20, verse 21, this is where you need to pay attention. It says, and he said unto him, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. That's not what they asked for Lot to do. The instruction was Lot, go to the mountain. But Lot is here negotiating to stay very close. So you are being pulled out of a life of sin. And many of us, this is where we are. Because we want to love God, but we don't want to embrace him completely. Like, let's not go all the way there to the mountain. Let me just stay right around here. You know, what's wrong with this place? Is there anything wrong with here? Hey, I know that I'm supposed to be a believer. I know I'm supposed to, you know, live a, a, a life of, of this matter. But I mean, what's this little thing? Is it not just here? And the scary thing is that those men did not tell him, absolutely no, take off and go to the mountain. They said, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. The simple fact that you are existing in the bandwidth, in the limit of grace, is not an indication that that is the life that God wants for you. Please hear me again. The simple fact that you are living off of the grace of God that continues to keep you from one day to another, that continues to keep you from one place to another, that continues to guide you and keep you even from one bad decision to another. The simple fact that you are still standing despite this, this posture, despite this decision that you have taken is not an indication that you have accepted God's counsel and you are living a life that is pleasing to him. Because this meant that we have accepted this thing. That is that that is not the counsel of God. That is not what you are asked to do, but we will accept that of you. Hey, let me say this right now. Many of us are playing with the timeline that we have. So because we want to exist in that space that, oh, the grace of God covers it. And because nothing seems to happen, right? So you go do that thing. You go do whatever you do. Nothing seems to happen right away. So we're thinking, you know, this must be, I mean, God must be okay with it. But the instruction was go to the mountain. And he said, no, I'm not going to go to the mountain. Is this city near? There's a city near. Why ask me to pull completely out of this life of sin? Why ask me to go through deliverance and then walk away from the old life I had completely and embrace this new life of chasing God? No, I still need to go to the parties once in a while. You know, I still have a boyfriend that we're still going to need to, you know, be you know intimate with one another. I'm still going to want to... Whew, the instruction is go to the mountain. I say, why all the way? Is it just because I need deliverance that I need to now cancel my old life? Let me just enjoy this little city. This is what I'm trying to explain to you, right? That the deliverance that comes for you, the deliverance from these things that plague you and this life of sin is going to require that you have a complete relocation. So they gave him the address, the mountains, and he said, no, it's too far. For some of us, that's how it is. It's too deep. It's not that deep. Let me just stay here. I, I, what is there? It's not, it's not that deep. It's interesting because something happened between a couple of people uh, that I, I know and one of them, you know, reacted in a certain way and the other person was messaging me in the background. I was like, oh, why did so-and-so person do that? It's not that deep. And my response was, it is that deep. And I just left it. Because you are the one thinking it's not that deep. But I tell you, it is that deep. The way God is seeing it, he does not want you around that thing at all. He said, go to the mountain. But this man is sitting down here and he thinks he's, you know, the, I, I, you know the slang, but you guys Nigerians, you know the slang. He thinks he's hyping God. Some of us, we think that we will hype God enough for him to bring down the standard. If we hype God enough, because we're very good when it comes to this Thanksgiving. We know all the names of God. We even have done competition where we knew how to mention the different names of God A to Z and we won the gift. So we know how to hype God and we think that we're going to hype God out of his standards. And that's a lie. The instruction was flee to the mountains. But he said, no, 
Oh no, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant has found grace in thy sight. Many of us are very good at this. We know how to psych people in our lives. You know, we know how to, as we'll say in Nigeria, whine people. We really think that we are, we are whining God. We are deceiving our own selves. He said, oh no, you are so good. You have shown me grace. You have shown me mercy. Oh my God, who am I without your grace? This is some of us' prayer. Oh, who am I without your mercy, oh God? While we're driving in intense traffic, headed to a man's house to spend the weekend there. We will say these things as it is. Oh, and there's even, the music playing in the car is even, uh, it's a praise song. We might even have a few tears as well. Oh, God. Oh, where would I be? Meanwhile, our overnight bag is in the back seat, headed to, I don't know what I want to say, Kunle's house. Hey, if somebody hears, <laughs> is with a Kunle, please. <laughs> I don't know if I'm speaking in, by the spirit or by myself, but I'm telling you right now, assess your life. Oh, Lord, you are so good. Oh, who am I without your goodness? Who am I without your mercy, oh God? But we, we, we already know what we are going to do. Our mind is already set that that uh, weekend we are going there. We are spending that weekend there. We are doing this. We are doing that. We, are, we already have that mind made up. And this is where Lot ran into problems. So they said, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. That I will not overthrow. So this city, yes. Since you want to stay there, we'll leave it for you. Hey, God. Say, I will not overthrow this city. May you not be the person insisting on clinging onto things in your life that God needs to overthrow. The only reason that they said they will not overthrow that city is because he insisted that he would stay there. But it doesn't mean that that city was going to stand for long. Because as long as the judgment of God has been released in a particular area, you do not have any business being in there. May you not be the person clinging on to something that God is trying to destroy before it destroys you. May you not be the person creating strategies, creating tactics to hold on to something that God is trying to destroy before it can destroy you. So they said, we have accepted thee concerning this thing and we will not overthrow the city. Father, in the name of Jesus, anything that has to be overthrown, please overthrow it. Any city, anything in my life, any sin, any attitude, any appetite that needs to be overthrown in my life before it overthrows me from my destiny. Father, let it be overthrown. This man needed to leave this place and that place was marked for destruction, but he decided I will stay here and they obliged him. I will say this again. The simple fact that you continue to live in a particular way that you know, this is not that, oh, you weren't aware, does not please God. And because God hasn't done anything, you think that you're actually doing the right thing. Just know that God is not mocked. God is absolutely not mocked. And they said, haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. You know, you know why? Because someone had already interceded for him. Not because he was that, you know, good or... Abraham had committed himself to this man's salvation. He had committed himself. He had stayed in prayer. I said, said, we can't do anything. They said, we won't do anything until you come thither. But the thing is, a person's prayers over you can go only so far. At some point, you will make a decision yourself to respond to the divine beckonings on your life that are looking to pull you out of where you are and to where you need to be. I say it again, a person's prayers over you can only go so far. At some point, you will have to use your will to comply with God, what God is asking of your life. So these people are trying to destroy the place and he needs to live there and he says no and they don't even force him. I think that to me is a scary thing because some of us really think that it will take God coming to force you. Oh, you better be clear right now that God will not even try to force you. He will give you your will. And you have to pray that you do not use your will to oppose what God is trying to do in your life. I will say that prayer again. Father, in the name of Jesus, everything in my life that must be overthrown so that it does not overthrow my destiny, Father, let it be taken down. 
Don't listen to my whimpering, Lord. Don't listen to my crying. Don't listen to my whining. Don't listen to... Some of us think... You know the way we manipulate friends or family members or husbands with tears? When we know that we are wrong. Lord, don't let me get in that de deception of my own self. Trying to manipulate God with tears. When God is trying to take something down before I can destroy you. Father, don't let me be in that situation. Anything that must be taken down, please take it down. If I will cry, I will cry and then, you know, my eyes will dry. But please take it down. Take it down. That's the prayer some of us must pray. Take it down. So this man insists on staying there. And guess what? It said, therefore, the name of the city was called Zor. Do you remember where Zor is? That Zor of a place is where he actually was in the first place in uh, chapter 13. I'm going to go there, but I want to read something here before, because we're going to have to go back into chapter 13 and we're going to pray shortly as I bring the message to the close. The Bible said the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. Some of us, ah, may the Lord have mercy on us. Our own is to stretch that grace of God like a rubber band, as though we're trying to find how far we can pull it until it snaps. These people were to destroy a particular place and Lot dragged his feet. Dragged his feet so much till they had to literally physically drag him out of that place. And even after dragging him out of there, he still wouldn't leave that place. The Bible says that the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot finally entered Zohar. Some of us are still in that tug of war. Leave, no. Leave, no. Cry today at the altar, go back tomorrow. Cry today, go back tomorrow. I want to just say this, that there is grace. Listen, that lie that you have been living in, that Satan has been giving you to make you think that you didn't have the ability to walk away from that behavior, that life, that sin, it is a lie because grace is available. Even Lot that was in, that was out of alignment knew it. So he was still saying, now your grace is plenty, your mercy is plenty. We will take advantage of that grace today. Now it says here, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plains. So understand that those plains, those cities, they were supposed to go down. Do you understand? The one that Lot was staying in, it wasn't like that one was exempt. It was supposed to go down. He just chose to hold on to it. And at the end of the day, the judgment of God will still be done. However long it takes, it will be done. Your own is to make sure that you are not there when the judgment is to fall there. It says, and he overthrew those cities and the plains and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. That is a total wipe. Verse chapter, verse number 26 rather. The Bible said, but his wife looked back from behind him. And I want you to understand that this, whew, I think when I was, you know, uh, reading this part of the Bible. I think when I would, you know, come across this part of the Bible, let me go back a little bit because maybe we may have missed it. Verse 17 said, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad. That is when they had forced him out and like removed his hand and taken him out. It said that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. So the instruction was clear. First of all, don't look behind you. Don't stay in the plain. We can then see in verse 25 that the plain was destroyed. All of those areas were supposed to be destroyed, including the place that Lot chose to stay. So the instruction was clear. Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. So it's almost as though this was the strategy to ensure two things. One, that he does not look behind. And two, that he's not found in the plain. They said, look not behind you, neither stay in the plain. How? Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Okay, that was the clear instruction. As of verse 26, this man had con completed his journey. I think when we were younger, and anybody can, please let me know if I just went to a bad church. <laughs> so please let me know, um, if this was your experience when you were growing up, I thought that this instance of Lot's wife looking back was that maybe they were just in their cart. You know, I guess maybe they were riding horses or whatever. I don't know. Right. And as they were going, you know, that's when she just looked back that, oh, maybe it was just, you know, a, a, a mistake. The Bible says here that Lot had entered the place he chose in verse 23. He was not on the way. I honestly, please, can I get reactions? Put something in the comment section. Let me know what kind of church 
I went to. Maybe me, I'm the only one that went to, <laughs> to a fake church. I really thought that, oh, poor woman, that maybe she just heard noise behind her. She said, let her just turn back and then this thing happened. But the Bible says in verse 23 that they had already arrived where Lot decided that he wanted to stay. Not where they asked him to go. And that by verse um, 26, it said, Lot's wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Do you understand that the only reason that this thing happened is because that man chose to sit down in that city that was still around, that was still close by. He chose to stay in that city that was around him because if he was in the mountain, I doubt that he would have been able to, or his wife. What I'm trying to point out to you here is, is that you have absolutely no business insisting on wanting to sit down around sin. So me, my own thought was that they were just riding and maybe as they were just mistakenly, the Bible said they had come into that city. But something about that place was calling on them. I don't know what is within you that is like a Lot's wife. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that if you insist on hanging around that sin that God is trying to pull you out of, if you are not careful at some point in time, the Lot's wife within you will turn back and bring that death that you were trying to escape back into your life. This man chose to stay near where they were executing judgment. And at some point in time, his wife turned back. His wife turned around. Shade, please, you will forgive me. I need to just uh, finish this message properly. At some point in time, his wife turned back. The point is that if you think that, oh, I'm so strong, you know, I can just stay around and whatnot, do not kid yourself. Because as we are humans, we are full of weaknesses. That what keeps them under control is the spirit of God within us. The grace of God that enables us to live above it. But when God gives you the guidance, basically the blueprint on how you escape the outcome of your weaknesses and you insist that you want to stay there, there will come a time that that Lot's wife, that appetite, that thing that has affinity for that sinful life, that sinful nature, at some point in time, it will sit back up and it will look back in that life that you walked out of. The only way to make that break is to move far away from it. Move so far that the people who knew you there can't recognize you anymore. I have people, somebody said, somebody posted something on my uh, channel recently. I had done a video and somebody posted on my ch channel recently. I don't even know who they were, but they clearly knew me. But they were like, man, I'm just amazed like when I see your videos because I don't know how you became this person. I don't know how you got here. And what I'm trying to tell you is that that's what you need to be. There cannot be any quick connection between you and Sodom. There cannot be any quick connection between you and that past life. They were essentially saying, I don't know how you, like, I don't know who you are right now because you are so different. It, you have to be okay with that. Some of us are so determined to hold on to portions of ourselves and insist on keeping our identity, keeping who, you know, our friends not to be. A, and that's the th same thing that will ensnare you. You stay around the thing that God is pulling you out of. Eventually, that appetite within you that has a name tag called Lot's wife will stand up one day and want to respond. It will stand up one day and want to respond to the crackling sound, to the smell that is coming from that life that you left behind. Because that smell will be very strong. The sounds from it will be very strong. And there would be that thing within you that might want to turn around. The only way that you ensure that you do not turn around is that you actually leave that place completely. Move into a completely different location. Go into the mountains. Be as far away from it as possible. You, you stand around that place. At some point, you will feel the need to turn around. And this is what I want to say. Now, we all know what happened with Lot's children afterwards. And my question when I was reading this portion of the Bible is, could this have happened if Lot's wife was alive? Can you imagine Lot's wife still being alive and his daughters plotting to take their turns? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? You have no idea how much ends up getting damaged, ends up getting destroyed in your life because you insisted on staying very close to a life that God was trying to send you miles away from. 
And at some point in time, something in you chooses to respond to it. And in that moment, it doesn't yet seem like, oh, it's the worst thing. It seems bad, but it's like, oh, it's not the worst thing until an abomination occurs. I do not believe that this thing that his daughters did would have happened if Lot's wife did not die. And the only reason that she had to go was because Lot insisted on staying in that vicinity. And this is the reason why God puts consecrations on us. This is the very reason. Because yes, you're not in Sodom, but this area that you are near Sodom is too volatile, is too sensitive, is too slippery. If you still stay there, there is a high chance that your steps will slip and bring you back into Sodom. And that's the reason why you are asked to flee to the mountain. That's the reason why you are asked to go very far. And that's the reason why many of us, if we haven't come into a place of maturity, we'll still be asking questions like, oh, but it's not a sin. Oh, but it's not a sin. Yes, it's not Sodom. But guess what? It's the slippery slope that leads you straight into Sodom before you realize that you are taking that slide down. That is the reason why you must leave that place. That is the reason why you must leave that place. And you know, the funny thing is this. Now, I want to go back to uh, chapter 13. Because this is why the Bible says to, to, to leave behind, right? How does it say it in Hebrews 12 and 1? Good. It says, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. It's not saying every sin. What it's saying is that for each person, you have that thing that easily besets you. Everyone has that one sin that easily besets them. This is the reason for consecrations. Not because of all the many sins. It's because of that one that seems to have your number. That one that seems to have you on speed dial is the reason for consecration. Why? Because if you're on the mountain, how much can you sleep that you will sleep and sleep into Sodom? But when you just choose to stay in the city right beside Sodom, in a blink, you have slept there. That is the reason for consecrations. So when you're hanging around, well, I just want to do the bare minimum of observing the Ten Commandments, you are a step away from sleeping back into Sodom. You are a step away from turning back and bringing death upon your own life. Maybe not physically, but in areas of your life. Because we know that from Adam and Eve, that the consequences of sin is death, but not always physical death. Areas of your life start to die. So it's a progressive death. It starts in sections. It starts in chunks. And before you know it, it literally takes over. This is the reason why we're giving consecrations. So you say, well, but the movie that I'm watching, it's not as if, you know, is, is this or that. I'm not watching in you know, pornography, but maybe God has told you to stop watching these romantic movies. Yes, it's not pornography, but you have a weakness for these romantic type movies. And those very type movies are the ones that lead you back into all these things within you that begin to call for the company of a man or that lead you back into a life of masturbation. Now, does the Bible say that don't watch movies? No, but when God gives you a consecration and says don't watch the movies, it's because he knows that those romance movies are the sin that easily besets you. It's the one that when you find yourself consuming it, before long, you will go and find a corner to go back into masturbation. That Sodom that you were pulled out of. Because God knows that that, that city that you want to hang out in, those movies that you want to keep watching, that is the slippery slope that brings you back into that scene of masturbation. So when God wants to help you, he tells you, move to the mountain. He tells you, don't even watch anyone. Okay, what of the one that they're doing action movie and they're... He said, don't even watch it. But they're shooting guns, don't watch. Leave it alone. But you're like, but it's not a sin. And then you wonder why you keep going back there. Consecrations are God's deepest wisdom to help drive our life based on how he knows we are wired. That's why it's different for each person. The sin that easily besets you is different from the sin that easily besets the next person. So you're told to move. You're told to live there. And so now I want to bring this message to a close shortly. And I'm going to go back to uh, Genesis chapter 13. Because when we talk about the things that you must leave, the things that you must detach yourself from in order to fully pursue God, in order to fully embrace this life that God is calling you to, Know this today that it may not necessarily look like sin. 
But as long as that is not what God has asked you to do, as long as that's not where God will have you, as long as that's not the life that God will have you live, understand that you are just a step away from going back into your old life. Uh, chapter 13 from verse 10. Please pay attention. Because when we talk about the difference between something being good and godly, this is really where it matters. Because we will choose something that in our eyes look good. We will choose something that in our mind is not a sin. This thing looks good. But the question is, is that God's plan? Is that God's instruction? Is that what God will have you do? This is what is crucial. So verse 10, it says, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And even, even as the garden of the Lord. This is the description of the life that, that Lot chose that he thought, oh, he's living the life that God called him to. He, he thought, oh, I'm living a life that, okay, I can, I can manage myself. It said this place was well watered everywhere. It says it looked like the garden of the Lord. It looked like the land of Egypt. We all know, you know, uh, what the land of Egypt represented for um, these people. It said that place that he described, he said, it was as thou comest unto Zohar. That's why I said, please pay attention. Please pay attention. That place that he was describing like this, that place that he was using all these accolades to describe, well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. The Bible says that this place was Zohar. The very same Zohar that he asked for the angels to let him go and sit inside when they were trying to save his life. What I'm trying to tell you is that every man has a sin that easily besets them. And it is God's mercy that brings you into a place of consecration so that you live a life that pulls you so far away from it that even when you sleep, it is not in any way able to bring you back into that life that you once lived. So this very place that he chose, he said it looks wonderful. He said it looks like the garden of the Lord. What I'm telling you, what I'm trying to point out is this, is that that sin that does easily beset you, it might look like this. It might look like Egypt. It might look like the garden of the Lord. It might look like it's well watered everywhere. But guess what? It is absolutely not where God will have you. And as long as you choose to remain there, you are a step away from the life of sin that God already pulled you out of. But the grace of God was available. Those men were going to wait for him so that he had enough time to make his movement to the mountain. But he tarried. And then his wife died there. And the Bible says, and it came to pass. When God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. So this thing that happened to him was not on God because God sent him out of there. He chose to remain in a city that was marked for demolition. And verse 30 is where I, I like it, it saddened me. Verse 30, please pay attention. After all of this mess has happened, after he has lost his wife, then verse 30, it says, And Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain. And his two daughters with him. It says, And Lot went up out of Zohar and dwelt in the mountain. And his two daughters with him. <laughs> he said, For he feared to dwell in Zohar. The very Zohar that they were trying to save him from, that he, he insisted he must stay in. At this point, after he had gone through much dealings that were not listed in God's script for his life, then he realized that it's like this Zohar will not pay me. The Bible said, then he went and dwelt in the mountains. Did he need to go through this kind of loss? Did he need to go through this kind of dealings? Did he need to go through this kind of trouble before he knew he would go to the mountain? The very mountain that those men said, go to the mountain, that he said, no, he's not going to go to the mountain. He's going to stay in the city. And that very city is Zohar. He goes through what he should not have dealt with. He experiences a loss that opens a major door for the enemy to establish a, a mess in his lineage. Only at that point did he decide to pick up his things and move to the mountain that he was originally asked to go to in the first place. 
My question is this, is that many of us have lost enough. Many of us have lost time, we've lost things. My question is how many more things do you want to lose before you eventually get up and go to that mountain that you were asked to go to in the first place? How many more things will have to be missing from your life before you eventually get up and go to the mountain that God asked you to in the first place? The thing with this life of sin is that it's very deceptive. It's very deceptive. It looks like it's a small thing right now, but by the time the effect starts cascading, ah, it's so deep that it's like, where do we begin to recover this thing from? Because that refusal to leave that place, first of all, you had no business in Sodom in the first place. Okay, fine, you ended up there. Then they said, leave that place. You said, no, I'm, I'm just going to stay close until his wife died. Made an opening for his daughters to commit this abomination. And it is from them that the Moabites, the Ammonites, those people came from. Did it have to be that way? And this is the question I want you to ask yourself. How much more will I lose? How much more will I suffer before I decide to heed this instruction and take myself away from this life and from the surrounding environs of this sin? I want us to please come off knees and begin to pray. Because we're going to ask for mercy, but we're going to ask for it genuinely. We're not going to ask for it like Lot, who's crying for mercy so that he can use it as an excuse to stay where he wants to stay, not where God has asked him to go. We're going to open our mouths and cry for mercy and cry for grace and say, Father, help me. Father, help me. Help me make up my mind. Take up my steps and move out of this life that you have decided to pull me out of. Help me move far away from it. Help me move as far away from it as possible. Help me take my journey to the mountains. Staying around these plains will not pay me. Those very plains that he chose because it looked lush, it looked wonderful, it looked beautiful. It was in those very plains that the biggest atrocity happened in his life that opened his lineage up to the mess that they did not recover from. We're going to ask God, help me. Help me. Prior to now, I thought it would be okay to stay in the plane. Oh, I can manage myself. I can't handle it. But it is clear that if I stay here long enough, I'm headed back into Sodom. So Jesus, help me. Show me mercy. This is our prayer.